This is Dr. Ted Hildebrand teaching Old Testament history, literature, and theology, lecture number 10 on the finishing up of the Jacob stories as well as the introduction and conclusion of the Joseph narrative, concluding the book of Genesis. Class, let's come to order. We got a lot of stuff today. We're going to finish by hook or by crook. We're going to finish Genesis today, okay? So this is we got a lot of stuff to cover today. Uh, you guys are working on numbers this week and articles and books and stuff like that for numbers. We'll have a quiz on Thursday. The following Thursday, a week from Thursday, we're having our first big exam. The exams are over what we've covered in class. There's old study guides up online if you're interested in that. I will produce as of Thursday night, Friday morning. I will have a new study guide out Friday morning of this week. But if you want to look at the old ones, there, there are a lot of it's the same. So uh, just say that by way. Now, Kyle's got an announcement here as far as review sessions and things. All right, so guys, in preparation for the exam, I'm holding two review sessions. Grace is also going to hold two. Mine are going to be on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in this room. On Monday, it's going to be 4.30 and 5.30. And I'm going to be taking questions specifically from the um, study guide. And I will email you um, when these sessions are, Kyle, send that, and we'll, we'll email it, make sure everybody gets uh, the information on that, okay? So that, that's coming up. Hannah? I was going to ask, when's Grace's review session? Um, yeah, I will email that to you. And so just give it, let's, let's focus on numbers till Thursday, and then after Thursday, then we'll refocus for the exam, and I'll try, I'll try to get that stuff out to you Friday morning, okay? All right, let's, uh, yes, Hannah. Skip the what? One of the articles that were, you assigned us two articles. Yeah, yeah, if it says skip it, then it's good to skip it. Okay, so, okay, let's uh, open with a word of prayer, and then we'll get down into uh, what we're talking about today, okay? Let's begin. Father, we thank you again for this opportunity to look at your word. We thank you for the great patriarchs of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and for the many things we can learn from their lives, and, and, and also that we can learn about you by watching the way that you interacted with these people, all of whom had problems, but all of whom you dealt with and you cared for. We thank you that you haven't given up on us, that even when we have problems, that you, you care for us and you love us, as demonstrated in your son's love, Jesus Christ. And in, in his name we pray, amen. Okay, let's uh, go through Genesis. Last time I think we were talking about the deception of Isaac. And basically Jacob and the mother, Rebecca, were tight and Isaac and Esau were tight. Isaac tells his son Esau, go out and get me some game that I love, barbecue it up just the way they do in Tennessee. And then Jacob's mother overhears that and she pulls Jacob aside and says, hey, we're gonna go in and deceive him. So Jacob gets rigged up with these uh, goat haired things and he basically uh, goes in and deceives his father who is blind and his father grabs him and his father realizes, doesn't realize his wrong son. So he blesses, he blesses Jacob Esau comes in then and says, Dad, you only got one blessing. My brother ripped me off. And, and Jacob seem, or Isaac seems to know that he's done wrong. And he says, no, Jacob is to have the blessing. And so Isaac says, no, the blessing needs to stay with Jacob. I will give you a blessing, my son, but, but you're going to basically serve your brother and that kind of thing. So you have this deception of Isaac and this parental favoritism, the father favoring one, the mother favoring the other, causing the sibling rivalry and this Jacob's lie, his deception. And Jacob's name sounds like deception, or heel grabber, heel grabber on the way out, but deception also, Jacob, sounds, uh, it's not from the direct root, but it sounds like a deceiver. And so Jacob deceives his father, which is really a bad thing. Um, and then seeking the power of the father's word. Now, what I'm wanting to suggest is that while Jacob lies to his father and he gets away with it, so to speak, does Jacob's lie have consequences? It has consequences for Isaac because Isaac, this guy is a blind old man, and now he realizes everyone that he should be able to trust would be what? His own family. I mean, his wife. Can he trust his wife? His wife has betrayed him. His sons have betrayed him. And so now he's a blind old man realizing the people that are closest to him, he can't trust any of them. And so Isaac, it says, just was trembling, was trembling. 
he's an old blind old man and, and he's left without anybody to trust. Esau, what happens because of the lie to Esau? Esau starts plotting, saying, when dad dies, I'm going to kill Jacob for what he did. When dad dies, he's going to let it go until dad dies. But when dad dies, I'm going to kill him. And by the way, was Esau, was Esau the kind of person that would do something like that? Is Esau a hunter who goes out and kills animals and things like that? And Esau would do something like that. And so Esau starts plotting the death of his brother. Now, Rebekah was also in on the lie. Rebekah was the wife of Isaac. And what did, what with Ribka or Rebekah, her favorite son is going to leave for 20 years, and she is left with whom? Her daughters-in-law, Esau, married two Hittite women, and Rebecca can't stand these women. Now, question is, have you ever seen a mother-in-law with daughters-in-law? Is that a problem? I just want to tell you right up front, mothers-in-laws and daughters-in-laws, is that a problem? There are all sorts of tensions can happen there. You've got too many women, what do they say, too many cooks in the room, too many women in the room like that. You've got loyalties for the son. Is the son loyal to his mother? Or is the son loyal to his wife? Okay, so you get this kind of thing. Um, by the way, I've often said, uh, you know, you're out looking for, you're out looking for a, a good uh, a wife, a woman. I'll say it from a woman's perspective. A woman's looking for a, a good man. Um, is one of the things you should look for for how that man treats his mother? No, is this, no, I'm ser serious. Is, uh, when you're looking at a guy, the way a guy treats his mother, that's an important, that's important, okay? But anyway, so Rebecca can't stand these Esau's wives, and so she's going bananas because she can't stand them. Jacob has to leave for 20 years. He's going to flee to Haran up in uh, Mesopotamia, northern Mesopotamia. He's going to flee. He's not going to see his family for 20 years, okay? Even his internet service is going to be cut off. There's going to be no connection with his family for 20 years, basically. So are there consequences to the deceiving of the father? Were there consequences for everyone that was involved? Yeah, so this is a big deal. Now, what happens with Jacob? Jacob's going to flee because he's going to flee because he, his brother's going to kill him. And, um, and so he flees. Where does he go? As he's going, um, and let me just kind of, can I use this room as a metaphor? Okay, this room is a metaphor. This is Israel, okay? This, you guys are the Mediterranean Sea. Is the Mediterranean Sea beautiful, swimming 68 degree, sandy beaches, wonderful place to swim, Mediterranean Sea. You guys are Israel. These are the mountains of Israel, okay? Up there is the Sea of Galilee in this canyon, this canyon here, the Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, and I'm the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is about 1,270 feet below sea level, which means the water all flows into it. How does the water get out? It doesn't. It has to evaporate. When the water evaporates, 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 what happens? The sea turns saltier and saltier and saltier. So the sea of the Dead Sea, actually the Jews don't call it the Dead Sea, they call it the Salt Sea. It's 33% salt. Is that a high salt concentration? The oceans are what, about 6 or 7%? Oceans, about 6 or 7. It's 33%. When you get in there, you float without having to, you basically can stand upright and you'll go about this high, this deep in the water, and you'll be like, just, you can go like this. When my mother was there, um, and this is hard, and especially on tape, but I know she doesn't have internet, so she'll never watch this, but this, this, <laughs> this, this, this fatter muscle float better? Okay, does muscle, have you guys seen, if, if a guy's totally fit muscle and stuff like that, what does he do in the water? Does, does it go down? Does he sink? Yes. Okay, fat floats. Okay, my mother goes in the Dead Sea and her legs came out from underneath her and she couldn't get her legs down to stand up. So they had to drag her over to the side and somebody had to stand her up because she couldn't put her feet down because it was so the salt. Okay, by the way, for you women too, do they do salt? They put salt on you to like suck stuff out of you, the bad stuff and things. So they have all sorts of, I think they call it ahava creams from the, from the Dead Sea. And you, you take these mud baths and stuff. It's supposed to be good for you and things. I don't know about that. But anyways, Salt Sea, okay? So salt, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea. You guys are Israel. What country is this? Okay, it's on the other side of the Jordan River. This is the country of Jordan today. King Hussein, his wife is actually American, really good guy. King Hussein's good 
good king over there and stuff. But anyway, so this is Jordan, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Israel, Mediterranean Sea. We'll come back to this in a minute. Where's Jacob going? Jacob is heading from down south. He's going up right into that region. And basically, he goes to the place called Bethel or Beit El. Now, when you look at Beit El or Bethel, okay, Beit El, what does El mean? You should know that by now. El means God, okay? El is a short form of Elohim. Elohim means God. El is a short form. So Beit means house of. So Beit El means house of God. Now, by the way, you guys know Beit because you know Beit Lechem. Has anybody ever heard of Beit Lechem? Beit Lechem? Beit Bethlehem? Beit Lechem or Bethlehem is Beit, house of, Lechem is bread. So Beit Lechem is house of bread. That's where Bethlehem comes from. So Beit means house of, and then they put different things on after it. So Jacob goes up there, and while he's there, um, this is where Jacob's ladder takes place. And let me just read down chapter 28, verse 12 and following. He goes there, and he goes to sleep. He's fleeing from Esau because Esau, he's afraid Esau is going to try to kill him, which he probably would have. And so he flees up there. He lays down. Do you remember in Sunday school where they tell you he lays down on a rock for a pillow? And he lays down at Bethel. And then he has this dream of Jacob's ladder. And uh, now let me just read through this. He had a dream in, in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven and the angels of God ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, the God of your father Isaac. I will give you, descend I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Now, as soon as he said, I'm going to give you the land, what is this? Is this the renewal of the covenant? As I was with Abraham, and I gave Abraham the covenant, and what was the covenant of? That you would get this land, that your seed would multiply as the stars of heaven, and you would be a blessing to all nations. I gave that covenant to Abraham. I reiterated it to Isaac. And now I'm giving it to you, Jacob. And it says, I will give you the land of your descendants, and your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. So that's the what? The land, the seed, and the blessing is again reiterated now to Jacob. So Abraham's God, Isaac's God, now becomes Jacob's God. Okay? And God meets him here. Now what's the thing with the stairway going up to heaven kind of thing? A lot of people suggest, and I'm, I think that this may be right, that what you have here is what's called a ziggurat. In Mesopotamia, do you know what a ziggurat is? You guys have had Mesopotamian history. and It's basically one of those step pyramid things, and it's a step pyramid that's different than Egypt. Egypt had those slick pyramids that were you know, rectangular and things. This was a step pyramid, and then in the front of it, there's a stairway that goes up to the top, and then at the top was the house of the god, so to speak, okay? And so some people believe that what Jacob is seeing here is a Mesopotamian ziggurat. The ziggurat was actually like a mountain. It was like the people built a mountain where their God could dwell at the top. And so God uses that imagery, God uses that imagery to say Jacob, because Jacob's familiar with that imagery and things like that. And so this Jacob's ladder may have been a ziggurat form. Again, we're guessing on that. Nobody knows for sure. I mean, we weren't there with the video camera or anything, but uh, so we don't know for sure. But it seems like this stairway going up with God at the top, that would be a, like a ziggurat kind of uh, configuration. So I want to suggest that this is when Jacob meets God for himself, and therefore there's this covenant renewal. And I want to kind of say that Abraham's God now becomes his God, and I want to suggest to you that Jacob leaving his family and meeting God for the first time, like he and God, um, that this is like the college years. Have, have some of you grown up in Christian families where, you know, your, your family goes to church, you're kind of a Christian family, and so your parents are religious, so you're kind of religious, but the question is, are you really religious? Then you leave your family and you go to college and when you get to college, can you kind of become whoever you want to become? And the question now is, it's not what your parents were or what your parents believed in. In college, it's what? It's what you believe in, right? And so in college, in a lot of ways, there's this differentiation where you become your own person. Where the, uh, I, was just, I went to a, 
a secular university where they were basically, <laughs> I started to build up my faith, they were trying to tear it down, jam Nietzsche down my throat and stuff. And it was just like, and I had to decide, am I gonna, am I gonna how should I say, still accept God and, and the principles that I grew up with, or do I become this kind of new person and explore all this new stuff that, you know, and things. And so I had to make a decision on those types of things. So in college, there's this really differentiation in terms of meeting God for yourself kind of thing. And so I think in many ways, Jacob going to Bethel is this kind of like this meeting of God for himself. Yeah, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, but that's not the question whether God is the God of Abraham and Isaac. Now the question becomes, God, is God Jacob's God? And so Jacob has to answer that question. He meets God here, and that's uh, kind of what happens. Now, Jacob in verse uh, 18 there, he sets up this memorial stone, and you're going to see the patriarchs, other people, uh, Moses, Joshua, these people, they'll set up these memorial stones, okay, to memorialize things. And, and by the way, even till this day, do we set up memorials? If you go down to Washington, D.C., are there, are there memorials to this day? Has anybody ever been up the Washington Memorial, a really high Washington Memorial? And did you see that? They, they had an earthquake, and they had, some guy had a video camera up on the top of the Washington Monument, showing the whole monument start to move. Do you think that'd be real fun to be up on the top of the Washington Monument when there's an earthquake? And they just uh, they filmed that, and apparently they worried about cracks now in the Washington Memorial. Uh, Washington Memorial, okay? Washington Memorial commemorates Washington. I go to the Vietnam Memorial. Have you guys been to the Vietnam Memorial? Memor memorializing those people that died in the Vietnam War. My father would go to the Korean Memorial. There's a Korean Memorial they just built and things. And so you get, you know, as we, we put things, uh, there's a new, actually, and I haven't seen this yet, the Martin Luther King Memorial was just built. And it looks really pretty interesting. And so I want to see that when we go down next time. Uh, but uh, anyways, so we, we memorialize things in stone. So he sets up the stone. Now, by the way, is he going to come back here 20 years from now? He's going to leave. He's going to come back in 20 years from now, and he's going to come back to Bethel. And he's, it's going to be pretty interesting what happens here 20 years later. Now, in, down just a little bit in verse 22, let me read this. Now, Jacob made a vow. He said, if God will be with me and watch over me on this journey I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I return in safety to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God. Is Jacob making this conditional? He's saying, God, if you bring me back here, you know, and you give me food and clothes and stuff, then you'll be my God. And this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house. God's house. Do you get the play on words there? God's house. What is that? Beit El is what? God's house. Do you see how he's setting up the stone? He said, this stone then will be God's house. And there's this play on the word Bethel. And, all that I, and that of all that I, you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, where does this tenth come from? The law, Moses will give the law later on. You guys have read the book of Leviticus and other things that say tenth and things like that. Is there any commandment in scripture so far about a tenth tithe? And the answer is no. Jacob just seems to know to give God a tenth or a tithe. By the way, did Abraham also pay Melchizedek a tenth after the battle with Sodom and Gomorrah and things? So it's, it's pretty interesting. Both Abraham and Isaac or Jacob seem to know about this tenth, pay his tithe. He says, when you bring me back here, I'll give you a tenth of everything I get while I'm gone for the time. Well, what happens next? So Jacob takes off from Bethel. And now he's going to go out the door back there, and he's going to go up to Haran in Mesopotamia. And when he's in Haran, he's going to meet... Where do you meet women in the ancient world? If you're going to meet women, where do you hang out? At the well, okay? You meet the woman at the well. Okay, now by the way, does this happen with Isaac and Rebecca? Rebecca's out there at the well, and the servant pulls up and says what? If she waters my camels, she's the one. Okay, what's that mean? She's a good worker and things. Uh, so you always meet women at the well. Moses, where did Moses meet Zipporah, his wife? At the well. So, you know, anyways, Jacob's at the well. And, it, and basically it says here, Laban had two daughters. The name of the older was Leah. By the way, is that significant? The name of the older was Leah. And the name of the younger was Rachel. And Leah was, had weak eyes, um, I mean, not elaborate, um, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Jacob was in love with Rachel and said, I will work seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. A um, couple things. Is this bartering for this girl? 
and saying, hey, I'll, I'll work for you for seven years, you give me your daughter. You know, is this girl like chopped liver or something, you know? Did, now, does she have to agree to it? Did they usually have the right of refusal? She agrees to it, and Jacob, by the way, Jacob labors for her for seven years. One question I had when I was a younger man is what separates between love and lust? Um, when I grew up in the church, they, they taught us that you basically had agape love. Agape love is what? You know, God love, you know, loving uh, things. Okay, and you had eros love. Eros love, sexual attraction love. And so it was agape love, and you had uh, this uh, lust, desire, eros, erotic love, okay? And it was always so clear, you know, agape love was over here, erotic love was over here. And then, unfortunately, well, fortunately for me, I met my wife. When I met my wife, all of a sudden, it was like these two things got like this. And my question to myself was, and I'm not serious, this was a serious question for me. Am I erotically in love with this woman because she's beautiful, she's wonderful, she's talented, she's everything I dreamed of? And am I in love with her? I lust her. I lust her. Do I love her? You see the difference? Do I love her or am I just attracted to her? Okay? And so I struggle with that. Whether, is this really love or is this lust or am I, you know, and I had to sort that stuff out. You say, okay, today I realize nobody probably struggles with this stuff anymore. This is old stuff, okay? But, but what I'm saying, I really struggle with that. I wanted to love her. Now question, Jacob looks at Rachel. He works for her for seven years. At the end of seven years, Rachel looks at this man. Question, does he love her or not? How many of you guys will work seven years for a girl? Okay, seven years. Is that a long time? Okay. Does time separate between love and lust? Is lust a consumptive now kind of thing? Is lust a consumptive now kind of thing? And let me be really corny. Can love wait? Is love, can love take time? Can love take time? And so I'm saying, after seven years, is Rachel pretty sure this guy loves her? I mean, these guys worked for her for seven years. Now, and I just think it's, it's kind of, it's beautiful. And by the way, the text here is beautiful too. It's kind of corny and stuff, but let me just read it because it's so beautiful. Okay, but we don't do beauty. For, we do better with sarcasm than beauty in our culture now. But Leah was okay. Rachel was in love, or Jacob was in love with Rachel. And he said, I'll work seven years in return for the younger daughter and stuff. So Jacob served seven years to get Rachel. But they seemed only like a few days to him because of his love for her. That's beautiful. Okay, that's beautiful. In other words, he's saying, hey, seven years just went by like fast and things. Now, is this the end of the story? This is just the beginning of the story because Laban, the father-in-law, has got up with the deal here. So what happens next, okay? Why is it ironic on Jacob's wedding night, okay? So Jacob's out there and they go to a big party. First of all, in that culture, how much of the woman do you actually get to see? Does anybody remember those pictures in Sinai where my wife was doing this uh, ball game back and forth with the woman in Sinai, and did, didn't you see that she had a veil on her like this that was all gold pieces? I mean, we're talking real gold. That thing is, how much would it be worth today with the price of gold? But anyways, she was covered with gold like that? It was kind of absolutely incredible. In those cultures, is it what do you see of the woman? Is it mostly just her eyes? Is she all the rest of her covered? Okay. So now they're in this wedding scene, and you say, well, he would still know her eyes, that it's different, because he says she had beautiful eyes and stuff. Rachel, or Leah, had weak eyes and things like that. What's the other problem? Is it possible that the, the women got switched in the tent situation? Now, what's the problem? You guys are at Gordon College. Question, is this place lit 24 hours a day? Are there lights around here? But when you get out to some places where there's no, you don't flip the switch and the lights come on, does it get really, really dark at night? And when you're in a Bedouin tent that's made out of a black goat's hair and things, when you're inside those, it gets so dark. Have you ever been in the context where you can hold your hand up in front of your face and you can't see it? It gets, it gets pitch dark in these places, okay? So what happens? There's a big switcheroo, okay? And um, what's going to happen there, okay? So let me just read the text. And Laban gave his servant go, okay, and when the morning came, and Jacob comes out of the tent. When morning came, he turns around, and there is Leah. And who was he expecting? Rachel, okay? Had he been deceived, okay? 
Now question, is it easy to get deceived in that culture by the way women cover themselves? Yes. Um, possibly. Okay. Let me, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk over here. I better walk over here, Kyle, because I don't want to get struck. Uh, okay. What I'm going to suggest to you is that it possibly, in other words, there was a big party, and there would have been talking going on in the party, but when they went in the tent, then there was probably silence in the tent that, that way in the night. Other things were going on. Okay, so, all right, I probably want to get out of that one. But uh, let me just tell you, while I'm over here, let me just tell you, my son was in Afghanistan, I told you that before, and we, we, they were in a battle with uh, Taliban-type people, and it was really interesting. They went after, there were three Taliban, they were going after the Taliban, and then all of a sudden the Taliban disappear. He says they're like ghosts, man, they just disappear. And then all of a sudden he looks down the road, and there are three women walking in the road. Now in, in Afghanistan, do the women totally cover themselves, even over their face, and they have these little uh, things that are like grids that they look out of so you can't even see their eyes. And so my son, uh, let me, I probably need to change the story a little bit, but my son, or uh, some individual who is a Marine, starts seeing these three women walking down the road, and he tells his commander, he says, let's shoot them. That's them, that's those guys. And the commander says, well, yeah, yeah, right, we're going to shoot women and stuff like that. Marines don't do this kind of stuff. And my son says, no, those are the guys, those are the guys and stuff. Now, question, could they go up and accost these women? You're in Afghanistan. Can Marine soldiers go up and accost a woman? No, it violates the culture. And my, the, the Marine that I know swears till this day that was how those three Taliban got away. They dressed up like women and got away. He could also tell by the way they were walking. And basically, that's how they got away. And they weren't able to accost them because they have to have a female interpreter to come up, you know, to accost them. And the female interpreter would talk to them and stuff, and they couldn't do that. So those guys got away. Was that a pretty slick move, I thought? They dressed like women and get away. Anyways, that, that actually happened. Now, okay, so all I'm saying is he wakes up. When I was a younger person, I always thought, how would you feel? You get married, your wedding night is like the best day of your, night of your life. You get up and you turn around and you see Leah, how would you feel as a man? About a number of years ago, I changed my perspective. How would you feel if you were Leah? And you just spent the night with him, and he turns around, and he looks at you, and you can see his face. Question, is Leah, is that terrible? You know what I'm saying? Do you know what it would feel like to feel rejected and like this? Now, by the way, Leah's the older sister. Is there something between older and younger sisters? No, I'm serious. I've had to face that in my own family. My younger daughter got married first. Question, is that, is it, it's unspoken. I mean, our family, I don't think we ever talked about it in those terms. But did the older sister, is there, is there stuff going on when the younger sister gets married first? There's stuff going on there, okay? And so, anyways, Leah, and now what's, what's, what's Laban do? The father says, well, okay, there's a little switch now. By the way, do you see the, the what's going on here? Why is this ironic? Before we get there, let me just do one thing. Why is this ironic? Does the deceiver get deceived? Does the deceiver get deceived? And so all this Jacob trickery and lying and deceiving, all of a sudden on his wedding night, the deceiver gets <laughs> deceived. And it kind of like it suits him, you know what I'm saying? He finally gets what's coming to him. And, uh, you know, and I don't, you know, I want to make any ethical statement. This is kind of ironic. Now, is Jacob polygamous? Now, he's going to basically hear, how does this set up? Well, what it sets up is that Laban says, okay, okay, in our culture, you got to marry the oldest daughter first before you get the younger daughter and stuff. And so Laban says, hey, Jacob, it just cost you another seven years. They'll just seem like a few minutes to you because you love her so much, right? So give me another seven years. Is Jacob going to work 14 years for these girls? Okay. Now, does he probably get Rachel after her, his week with Leah is completed? Then he probably was given Rachel right after that, but he still has to work the seven years, okay? So that's probably how it went down. But anyway, so he works another seven years for uh, the younger one. Now, is Jacob polygamous? Now, is polygamous, is polygamous cool in American culture? Uh, does anybody follow that Warren, what was his name, Warren Jeffords, was it, or... Warren Jeffords, the guy that was had all these wives down in Texas and stuff, was just trying. The guy's put in prison, right? The guy put in prison. I think he married some of the girls he was marrying, like 13, 14 year old girls, okay? Really bad stuff, okay? This guy was bad. It's part of the, you know, 
is part of the Mormon tradition way back and stuff like that was Joseph Smith had multiple wives and stuff. Now, again, the Mormons around the turn of the century and stuff, they eliminated polygamy and stuff, but some of the ones that are going back to the original Mormonism, they still have many wives and stuff, and they, they push that, and they're, a lot of them are silent when you, it comes to condemnation of it and things. So you've got to be careful with that. Is Jacob polygamous? Can you use this then to say, Jacob was polygamous, therefore we should be polygamous? And what I want to suggest to you is, when you're dealing with historical narratives, do you have to separate that which is normative from that which is non-normative. In other words, does the Bible sometimes just describe what happened? And it's not putting an approval or disapproval on it, it's just describing what happened. It's not meant to be universalized, okay? Jacob lies to his father. Question, are we supposed to lie to our parents? No, okay? Did Jacob do stuff that was wrong? Jacob did things that were wrong, okay? And therefore, you can't take stuff out of history because the Bible oftentimes is, is, is just recording history. It's what happened. Right or wrong, it's what happened. By the way, this is one of the reasons why I love the Bible, okay? You say, because Jacob's polygamous, you love the Bible? No. <laughs> Let me explain. Let me explain. In many of the other cultures, when you go to, let's say, Mari, and you're going to talk to Zimri Lin, and he is the big king of Mari, okay? When he puts annals, the king's annals go in, does it make Zimri Lin look like he's the big shot? Zimri Lin does all these great things. Because of Zimri Lin, you have a good life. And because of Zimri Lin, uh, there's water in the canals. Because of Zimri Lin, he does all... In the other cultures, do they, are the kings portrayed as these people who do all these wonderful things, wonderful things, wonderful things? What's the problem with the Bible? Tell me about the great kings of Israel. You say, well, Israel had their big kings too. David. And you say, David was the man after God's own heart. And then you start thinking, uh, yeah, David. Um, what was her name? Uh, yeah. So you say, okay, we got to back off of David. But David's really the man, right? You say, well, well Solomon. Solomon's the wisest man that ever lived. You start going, Solomon was the big king of Israel. And you say, Solomon, yeah, was it 700 wives, 300 concubines? Okay, he serves other gods again. You say, well, Rehoboam, well, Rehoboam was a disaster. You start going down. Where are the kings? In the Bible, do all the kings, the great men of Israel, Saul, the first king of Israel, do all these guys have warts? Do they all have problems? And the Bible, does the Bible cover their warts? Does the Bible cover their cinders? Does the Bible tell it like it is? So what I'm saying is in the other cultures, they make their great men look like these great heroes. In the Bible, all of their heroes, do all of the heroes in the Bible have problems? Every one of them. And so that's why I love the scriptures, because quest, question, do I have problems too? Those guys all had problems. Did God deal with them and love them and care for them? Yes, I've got problems too. Does that mean God's going to throw me away? No, and the answer is no. God loves us beyond our faults and things. And so the Bible tells it like it is. And, and that is a rare book in the ancient world. That is really rare. And Jacob's got problems. Jacob's got wives. By the way, the fact that he's got two wives now, is this going to be a problem? Question, does polygamy work? The Bible tells you the results. Question, did it work having two wives? And then they start what? They start a competition. And who's going to have the most kids, right? And it's very interesting here when you look at this. But let me go back to this. So what I'm suggesting is when you're reading history, you've got to be careful about separating that which is normative, that which is for all time, and that which is non-normative, that which is just, in other words, Jacob did this and it wasn't really right, but he did it anyway. And so it's only meant for that time and that place. It was something that he did. He lied to his father. That is not meant to be all time lie for your father and stuff. But, um, you know, so... You've got to separate, when you're dealing with history, you've got to separate the normative from the non-normative, and that's really important. Now, God comes along, and I love this. Go down in chapter 29 here. Jacob's got two wives, Rachel and Leah. Which one does he love? Rachel. Whose womb does God open? Leah's. Does God side with the underdog? Do you see this happen over and over again in Scripture? Does God side with the unloved wife, and God opens her womb, can Rachel have kids? No, Rachel can't have kids. And so Rachel's womb is closed, Leah's womb is open. By the way, will these two women, you say, Jacob's this cheat and deceiver, does Jacob and his Rachel and Leah, do they build the 12 tribes of Israel? 
you understand these are where the 12 tribes come from is Jacob and Rachel and Leah and their handmaids basically produce the 12 tribes of Israel. You say, man, if I were going to do the 12 tribes of Israel, you'd try to make their mother a little bit better, you know what I'm saying? Make it into a nice story, but it's really this polygamous relationship here. So God opens the womb of Leah. Leah has then Reuben, who's the firstborn, and then many of the children afterwards, and Rachel will, um, well, we'll see what happens with Rachel. Rachel says, hey, I need to have some kids. So what happens in chapter uh, 30 here, verse 14, it says, during the wheat harvest, which is a late spring, Reuben went out into the fields and found some mandrakes. Now, what are these mandrakes? The mandrake plants, we're told. They're mandrake plants, which he brought to his mother Leah. So Reuben, Reuben the oldest, brings to his mother Rhea, Leah these mandrake plants. And Rachel said to Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. But, she, but Leah said to her, wasn't it enough that you took away my husband? Will you take my son's mandrakes too? Does Leah get a little bit huffy here? Leah says, hey, you stole my husband, and now you're taking my son's mandrakes. Like, what's the deal with this mandrake plant business and stuff? Very well, Rachel says, he can sleep with you tonight. Jacob gets sold for a couple mandrake plants, okay? These women are bartering over who's going to sleep with the husband, and the, the sell-off was a couple mandrake plants. They sell the husband. He can sleep with you tonight. You give me a couple mandrakes, okay? This guy is worth a couple plants, okay? Not too good. And you say, well, okay. What's going on with these mandrake plants? It's, it's believed in the ancient world that the mandrake plants were basically, um, okay, the mandrake plants were largely fertility, for fertility, that if you got these mandrake plants, now there's probably not much to this, but that these mandrake plants were viewed by that culture as fertility plants. Uh, we would say maybe an aphrodisiac, okay? You take this and it makes you sexually potent. Or, oh, that's what we say, Viagra. Oh, this, uh, no, oh, gee. Okay, um, this is, uh, this is, take, I, did, I did never had that thought before, but anyways, this is kind of like the ancient, all right, we we'll just uh, better not get out of that. Okay, um, but this is what this would be in the ancient world. Now, what's the problem here, besides the videotape being on? Um, <laughs> the problem is this. Um, who is going to give Rachel her child? Is it going to be because she got the mandrakes? The text makes it very clear. She does get the mandrakes, but the text makes it very clear if it goes down, it says, God listened to Leah, and she gets pregnant and has another son. But then you go down to verse 22, and it says, God remembered Rachel, and he listened to her, and he opened her womb, and she became pregnant and gave birth to her son. And she said, God has taken away my disgrace, and she named him her first son. And this is important. Who was Rachel's first son? Joseph. God has added. Jehovah has added to me. Okay, may the Lord add to me another son. And so Rachel has a son. Who gives Rachel her son? Is it a result of the mandrakes? No. God opened her womb, and she has Joseph. Is Joseph going to be a gem? Joseph is one of the few gems in the Bible. Daniel's the other one in the Old Testament. These two guys are above reproach, but all the other guys have problems. Joseph's going to be a really good guy. So her first son, Joseph, then, not a result of the mandrakes. God does it. And by the way, Joseph was Rachel's first son, who was Rachel's last son? Benjamin. Benjamin, very important phrase. Ben means son of, son of. Ben means son of. Yamin means right hand. What, in, in those cultures, is your right hand the, the hand of like honor and things? Um, let me just say this. Since, um, if, you're in, if you're in the Arab culture and the Arab dude comes up and shakes you with his left hand, do you understand that is a major insult? Okay? The right hand is the hand of blessing. If he shakes with your left hand, you say, what does that mean? They do certain things with their left hand and only their left hand in certain rooms of the house before they flush, if you know what I mean. Okay? And that is always done with the left hand, with or without toilet paper. And you, okay, now you understand you're Americans and stuff like that, but over there, you know what I'm saying? They don't have luxuries, and I'm talking toilet paper now. So the left hand. So if a person shakes you with the left hand, all I'm telling you is that's a major insult. I've had that happen to me, by the way. 
I didn't, this was before I knew what was coming off. And I said, boy, that's really weird. And then I went back and talked to somebody. They told me what it means. So if you don't want to even shake your right hand, you shake with your right hand, the hand of honor, not the, the left hand. So it's a big deal. Son of my right hand, Benjamin, beautiful name, Benjamin, my grandson's name, Benjamin, son of my right hand, son of the blessing power and things like that. So Benjamin and Joseph are going to be the two sons of Rachel. And then where does Rachel die? She dies having Benjamin in birth. Now, do women die in our culture having, having infants? Usually not in American culture. In other places of the world, do women die having children? Yes, it happens all over the place, okay? And Rachel is going to die having Benjamin, basically, in birth. Um, she's going to die having Benjamin and things. Now, what happens? Where does she die? This becomes significant. Rachel dies, but where does she die? She dies just outside a city called Bethlehem. She dies just outside the city of Bethlehem. Now, why is that significant? Because Rachel then, because of her death, they set up a memorial to her. They set up a memorial on the major uh, close, uh, the, uh, highway there that goes down the spine of Israel. They set up a memorial to Rachel outside of Bethlehem, and she is viewed as the patriot the patriarchess or whatever of, of, of Bethlehem. Now, in the time of Jesus, in the time of Jesus, does anybody remember Rachel gets mentioned in the time of Jesus in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18? And what happens in Matthew chapter 2? Who finds out that Jesus is born in Bethlehem? The wise men come to Herod, and Herod says, hey, you guys go down to Bethlehem, find the young child, and when you find him, bring back word to me. Do the wise men ever go back to Herod? No, they skedaddle out of there, and Herod realizes he's been tricked by the wise men, and so what does Herod do? He goes into Bethlehem, and he kills all the infants, what, two years old and under. And then do you remember what the biblical text says there? Matthew chapter 2, verse 18 says this, right after the slaying of the infants in Bethlehem, it says, And a voice was heard in Ramah, to the north, quite a distance to the north, weeping and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And so what you get is this kind of echo. Rachel dies outside of Bethlehem, and 2,000 years, you know, however many years later, about 2,000 years, or actually 1,700 years or so, you get this echo in Jesus. Rachel's weeping for her children, the children of Bethlehem. She's the patriarchess of Beth Bethlehem. And so basically you get this echo and that's in the time of Jesus. But say, Hildebrandt, you forgot something there. Because Matthew is quoting Jeremiah. And Jeremiah says, Rachel weeping for her children is heard all the way up into Ramah. Why is Jeremiah quoting that? Jeremiah is in the middle between Jacob and Jesus. Jeremiah is in the middle. You know why Jeremiah said that? Because that's when the people were taken captive to Babylon. This is the exile. Jeremiah is referring to the Babylonian exile. When Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and those guys get all hauled off to Babylon, Jeremiah is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem, saying Jerusalem is destroyed and Rachel is weeping for her children as they get hauled off and scattered off to Babylon. So you get this echo from Rachel's death outside. You get this echo in the exile where the children are exiled to Babylon and to Jesus Christ who is born and those infants are slain. And so you get this kind of triad of echo through Scripture. And it's really kind of interesting with Rachel dying outside of Bethlehem. And you can go there till this day. They have a memorial to Rachel outside of Bethlehem till this day. And so, okay, so Rachel dies and things. Now, what's going to happen? Jacob's going to be leaving, uh, going to be leaving Mesopotamia. So he's from outside the door. He's going to relieve Laban. Laban's ripped him off. He's ripped Laban off. They're kind of back and forth and things. And so his family uh, starts to leave. But as they start to leave, and this is in chapter 31 here, um, Rachel steals one of the family gods. She steals the family gods, and then Laban chases after Jacob, catches up with Jacob, and says, Jacob, what are you doing? You're running away from me? You stole all my goods? You stole my daughters? You stole all my grandkids? I'm never going to see them again and stuff? What are you doing, Jacob? And then, he, moreover, Jacob, you stole my gods too. Jacob says, man, I didn't steal your gods. I didn't steal your gods. Anybody you find your gods with, man, you can kill them. I didn't take your gods. I don't want your stupid gods. He didn't say that because we're going to find out later. Jacob was probably messing around with gods too. What happens? Rachel 
So he comes in, and, and basically the father, the father approaches his daughter. You know how a father approaches a daughter. And the daughter looks at him and says, Dad. And then, okay. Now, Laban had gone uh, to shear a sheep, and Rachel st stole the family gods and things like that. Laban pursues. And then down here, um, Rachel said to her father, Don't be angry, my lord. I cannot stand up now. Let me, let me use the King James Version because I like it better. He says, Father, I can't stand up now for the manner of women is upon me. And so she's got to say, she's sitting on the family God, okay? And she says, I can't get up, Dad, because, you know, you know, it's this time of the month and stuff, so I can't get up. Okay, is that pretty slick, Rachel? Yeah, okay, anyways. By the way, you say, how big is this God that she's sitting on? I think you got to remember, you know, you got like tribal gods and stuff, you've got big ones and stuff, but when you're talking family gods, you're talking six-inch gods, this kind of stuff. Why did she want the family gods? Some people have suggested that whoever had the family gods had the, the inheritance. And so she could show up 20 years later and say, Dad, see, I'm part of this family, therefore I get part of the inheritance. And so there was some inheritance rights. Uh, somebody suggested in the last class, it was a very interesting suggestion, that maybe the gods had to do with fertility. And she was trying, Rachel was trying to say she was going to serve the family gods so she could be more fertile. Did the gods really give her children? No, Jehovah gave her children. But she may have been playing with other gods, and well, she was playing with other gods. for. But most people think it's inheritance, but the... It was an interesting suggestion in class about the fertility thing. Now, let's go to the wrestling match. Okay, chapter 32. This is an important chapter. Jacob is coming down from Mesopotamia, from Haran. He passes Damascus. He's on what they call the King's Highway. He comes down right to where this fellow with the black shirt is. There's a, there's a wadi, a valley that goes in there called the Jabbok. It's a Jabbok. They call it the Jabbok River. I'll never forget going to the Jabbok River. I go there and I'm looking for this Jabbok River, right? Uh, it was this wide, this wide. I'm talking this deep. It's not a river. The, yeah, I looked at it and I said, where I come from, that's like, it's a little bit too big for a ditch, but I've seen ditches bigger than that, man, and stuff. And I was really disappointed because I was thinking this, the Jabbok River, and I get there and seriously, I, you could have jumped over it. It was, and it was, it was only about this deep, okay? So, you know, anyways, the, you understand? Do they have a lot less water? I, I grew up on the Niagara River, okay? You know the Niagara? Niagara's got, that's a, that's a real river. These things, when they talk, I, when I was young, they said, I've seen the mighty Jordan roll. Have you ever seen the mighty? The Jordan River is about as wide as this room. The Jordan River. It averages three feet deep. Now, where I come from, do we call those rivers? I, I grew up on the Niagara. The Niagara is a river. Where I grew up, they call those creeks. Okay, so what I'm saying is, is there a lot less water over there? In America, we used to, you know, Lake Erie, Lake Superior. Have you ever been out Lake Superior? Oh, you guys do the ocean here. Anyways, but anyway, so but what I'm saying, we, we've got a lot more water, and there, there it's a lot less. So what happens? Jacob's coming down. Now, where is Esau? Esau, this is the Dead Sea. Esau is from down here in the land of Edom. And Esau, with 400 of his men, is going north. Now, is that going to be a problem? Okay. Jacob's going to be meeting Esau with his 400 men. Is Jacob scared to death? Does anybody remember uh, Mr. Miyagi, uh, what was it, Karate Kid 2, where Sato, after all those years, was going to get Miyagi for stealing his woman, and he was going to kill Miyagi after all these years. Do people harbor anger for, for decades within a family? I'm talking about your own families. Do brothers and sisters in your father's family, do they ever harbor anger towards someone for a, gener for a generation, for 10, 20 years? I knew a guy named Herb King. I worked in a maximum security prison. And Herb was in prison for 35 years for murder. He finally got out. He was an old man when he got out. He was in his late 50s. They gave him his 75 bucks. He caught a bus from Indiana State Prison in Indiana City down to Georgia, where he's from. And after 35 years, he walked in the door of his house, and this is, this is the honest truth, and by the way, I'm using his real name now because it doesn't matter anymore, but it matters to me. He walked in after 35 years in a penitentiary. He walks into his fam The day he's free, he walks into his house. And there was a guy with the 12-gauge in there, and the day he walked in the door of his house, he got blown away. The guy killed him after 35 years. Shot him dead. He walks in the front door, boom, bullet in the chest. He's dead. Question, had that guy been harboring anger toward Herb 
for 35 years while he was in prison. And her, he's in the graveyard now after 35 years. Do people harbor that kind of stuff? Is Jacob, when he hears that Esau's coming up with 400 guys, is Jacob scared out of his mind? Because the last time he saw Esau, he thought he was going to swear he's going to kill him. When he's got 400 guys, what's Jacob got? 400 guys? Jacob's got what? A bunch of women and children. Can he defend himself? He can't. Now, by the way, is Jacob a man's man? I have a real problem with Jacob. There's some stuff that really bothers me about him. When Esau is coming to him, first of all, he sends Esau gifts. Is that a really smart thing? Somebody's really angry at you. Do you do gifts and stuff? I try flowers. They work sometimes, okay? Not all the time, but they work sometimes. It's worth a try. It's worth a try. Flowers are good, okay? You get about 50-50, okay? Chocolate also works, and you got to work it out, okay? So anyways, he sends Esau gifts. Do, does, do gifts pacify anger sometimes? Okay, sometimes they do. Now, he's scared. So what does he do? He divides up his family, and who does he put first? He's the man-man, so he says, hey, it's my brother. He's coming to kill me. I should be the first out there. So you guys hide in the back. If he kills me or goes after me, you guys run for your life. Is that, is that Jacob? No. What's this guy do? He puts his kids out, Leah and the kids out front, and Rachel with the back. And where is he? He's in the back. Is this a man's... I'm sorry. Is this... What, what, what do you want to, the word that comes to my mind is coward. Is this guy, is this what a father should be? Should a father protect his family or should the father hide behind his family? Okay, I'm sorry. This really bothers me with him. This guy is a, that's about as low as you get. So what happens? That night, he's at the Jabbok Wadi. He's down there by himself. And all of a sudden then, he has these, this wrestling match with, let me see verse 24 here. And check this out. It says then, that night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his maidservants and stuff. And so Jacob was left alone. And a man, and it says, a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched, the man saw that he could not overpower him. Very interesting. Is this man, is Jacob able to go head to head with this man? And so the man could not overpower him. But then finally the man says, so he touched his, his socket of his hip, put his hip out. So his hip was wrenched and as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. And Jacob said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Is Jacob really in this blessing thing? I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. And the man said, your name is no longer Jacob, but Israel. Okay, Israel. And this is where Jacob then, first of all, when you're in trouble, do you pray? Jacob's in trouble. He's got to face Esau. Do you pray when you're in trouble? Yes, okay? Jacob makes the prayer and stuff. Jacob, now let's talk about Jacob's name first. Jacob's name means what? It kind of sounds like deceiver. And now he's going to be given the name Israel. What does Israel mean? Israel, Israel. El, El means what? El means God. Yisrael means he who struggles with God or he who wrestles with God. By the way, the name Israel is that descriptive of the Jews for like all time. Have the Jews wrestled with God throughout their generations for, for thousands of millennium? Okay, for millennium on millennium. Okay, the Jews have struggled with God and so they are named Israel, he who struggles with God. And this becomes the beginning of the name Israel that's given to the 12 tribes, comes out of Jacob. Jacob is given a new name. And that's really kind of a neat thing. He moves from deceiver to he who wrestles or struggles with God. Now, Jacob names the place Piniel. Now, when you look at this term Piniel, what does it, it's Pineel. Pine means face. Pine means face. El means God. What does this name of the place mean? The name of the place means face of God. Now, why does Jacob name it Peniel? It tells us explicitly. He says, I'm going to call it Peniel, or face of God, because I saw God face to face, and my life was spared. Jacob thought that he was wrestling with whom? A man? No. He says, it wasn't a man, just a man. Yeah, it was called a man, but this, I saw God face to face. And so he names the place Peniel. What people have suggested, and I would agree with this, you have what's called in the Old Testament a theophany and a Christophany. A theophany, 
means that someone saw God. Like, do you remember on Mount Sinai, God was like at the top of the mountain, the mountain shaken, Moses is up there, his face like shines and stuff, and he comes down. That's a theophany where God appears and it kind of blows people away. The glory kind of overwhelms people. So that's, that's called a theophany, appearance of God. A Christophany is an appearance of Christ before Christ was actually born. And what I'm suggesting is that Jacob wrestled with a man and the man... He couldn't defeat him. The man couldn't get away until he touched his hip and put it out. What I'm suggesting is that that very likely was Jesus Christ in the flesh beforehand. And Jesus Christ with just his normal strength and stuff, wrestling with Jacob until the morning. And then he, he realized and so he says, wham, bam, he puts his hip out. Okay, but the, So I'm suggesting that that was a Christophany. And then Jacob concludes, this wasn't a normal man. This is, I saw God face to face. And if it's Jesus, then it's okay. It's God. Okay. So does that make sense? So that's kind of what, how I look at this. Many other people look at it the same way and things. It's the name Peniel. Uh, changes his name here. Well, why did the angel change Jacob's name? Deceiver to this he who wrestles with God. And now he's seen God face to face and wrestled with him. And uh, we're suggesting that that's Jesus and things. Now, um, some people look at chapter 32, verse 32, and let me read this verse to you. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. I should say this. He's got to meet Esau in the morning, right? How many of you have ever had dreams, and some big guy or something's after you, and you can always do what? Can you always run and get away? You always run and get away. Now what does God do to Jacob? Jacob's hip is gone. Question, can Jacob run away from Esau? No. He can't run now. He's got to face Esau. God, in other words, he can't you know, take things in control and say, I'm just going to skedaddle. I'm going to run, run away from him. At least I can beat him on faster than he is. Now his hip is out. He's now got to face Esau face to face. And it's just he can't get away and stuff. Now, in chapter 32, verse 32, though, it says this. Some people think this verse was added later by later editors. It says, therefore... To this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the sock of the hip, of the hip, because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. So the text says, until this day, they still don't eat that tendon that's by the hip because Jacob's hip was out there. Until this day. Question, was that statement later on added? The narrative is telling you about Jacob. This thing that we don't eat that until this day, that was added later. Is Moses much later? Is Moses much later than Jacob? Yeah, at least 400 years. Is it possible Moses wrote that and said we still don't eat the tendon? And it was 400 years after. So could this statement in 3232 have been written by Moses? Sure, it could have. Okay, Moses was 400 years after, and he puts in this explanatory statement about why we don't eat the tendon that's uh, that's by the the socket of the hip socket there. So it doesn't have to be added later, like, you know, after the time of Moses. Moses could have written it. Now, they come to the meeting of Esau, okay? Family members meeting after years and years, and they, they finally meet. Esau falls on his brother, weeping and hugging, you know, brothers, finally, after all this period of time. Have you guys ever been away from brothers for a long period of time, and you get back together? It's a beautiful thing. There's nobody like a brother or sister that you've grown up with and things. And so they meet years later and stuff. It's really a beautiful time. Now, does Jacob lie once again to his brother Esau? And the answer is, after all this time, Jacob's going to lie again. They're meeting at, at the Wadi Jabbok there. Esau comes up with his 400 guys. He tells Jacob, he says, Jacob, I don't want your gifts, Jacob. Take your gifts back. I'm wealthy. Hey, why don't you come down and see my place? I live down here by the bottom of the Dead Sea and all this red rocks, Nubian sandstone, Petra. It's beautiful down there. Stuff. Why don't you come down and see me? Jacob says, oh, yeah, I'll come down and see you and stuff. And so, and so Jacob's, Esau says, well, my guys will protect your sheep and goats and stuff for you, and we'll come down. Jacob says, oh, no, no, my sheep and goats, they got to go slow and stuff. So Jacob, Esau, you just go back home, and I'll come down and visit you. You just go back home. Now, if you don't know anything about geography, you won't know that he lied. Where is Jacob? Jacob's up there. Esau goes back home here. The next thing you read in the text in the next chapter, chapter 34, where is Jacob? Jacob is over here at Shechem, and that's where his daughter gets raped. Okay? Did Jacob lie to Esau? Tell him that he's going to meet him down here and then go the opposite direction. Is this guy still lying to people? 
It drives you nuts. After all this time, he still lies to his brother. And by the way, you know that from some of the geography. Now, here's where Esau gets off. And let me just kind of run through this. Esau, Esau becomes the father of the Edomites. The Edomites are his descendants. So whenever you see Edom in Scripture, Edomites, Edom, Edomites, those are Esau's descendants. By the way, I should say, whenever you see Edomites in Scripture, the Edomites will always do pretty much the same thing. What do the Edomites do pretty much every time? They kill Jews, okay? The Edomites, when you see in Scripture and you say Edomites, you remember Hildebrand says, whenever you see an Edomite, he's going to kill a Jew. That, that, I'm serious. That happens like over, I'm, I'm exaggerating, obviously. But, but most of the time in Scripture, the Edomites are killing Jews. The whole book of Obadiah, let me summarize, the whole book of Obadiah, Obadiah is only one chapter, okay? But the whole book is about the Edomites and how the Edomites had killed Jews and, you know, basically curses come upon them for killing people in helpless states and stuff. So the book of Obadiah, the prophet, is largely geared against the Edomites. Now, the most famous Edomite that you know is this guy named Herod. Herod was an Idumean, an Idumean, do you hear the D and the M? They're the same D and the M, the Idumean. Herod was an Idumean. That meant that King Herod, king of the Jews, was an Edomite. Now, how is it that you're an Edomite and you're king over the Jews? Well, if you can't be a Jew, what's the next best thing you can do? So if Herod goes to marry somebody, what should that person be? A Jewish princess. And so Herod, have you ever heard of the Maccabees? Herod picks one of the Maccabean princesses. Her name was Miriamne, and she was a princess in the Maccabean line. Did the Jews reverence the Maccabees? The Maccabees, the Feast of Hanukkah, is built on that. The Jews reverenced the Maccabees because they were heroes. And so he marries one of the Maccabees girls, okay? Now, what's the problem with Herod? Does Herod kill people? He kills his own wife, Miriamne. She's Jewish. She's a Jewish princess. He kills his own wife. Is this guy really stupid? Okay, he kills his Jewish wife, Cleopatra. Does anybody remember uh, Anthony and Cleopatra? Most of you know Mark Anthony and stuff. He's still singing and stuff. But anyways, Anthony and Cleopatra. Cleopatra, Cleopatra hated Herod. Herod killed his wife and stuff. And Herod killed his sons also. I took my son. Herod built this place down in uh, Jericho, New Testament Jericho. And I had my son there. And we were going. And it's, uh, it's covered with barbed wire because they don't want you getting in there. But Herod had it. Herod took his own sons into these pools that he made, and he drowned his, he had some of his men drowned his own sons. Is this guy a butcher? So when I went there, we climbed through the barbed wire and stuff, and I had to get a picture of, so I put my son, he doesn't know any history, he's a computer geek, so I put him, so I put him in the thing and I took a picture of him and stuff. I was going to put my hand on his head like I was pushing him under or something, but like I got a picture of him in the thing until they came and chased us away, we weren't supposed to be in there. We got ripped up with the barbed wire. The barbed wire, you got to be careful with the barbed wire, it like snags you and stuff. And when you're running, it's hard anyways. So, but, but if you're going to go all the way from America, question, if you're going to go all the way from America to a place like that, are you going to let a little barbed wire stop you? No, I hope you got more guts than that. But then you'd be able to run fast too. So nobody's touching your hip. So anyways, here, let me just kind of, uh, yeah, somebody says, you didn't really do that, did you? <laughs> he didn't know. Anyways. This is the salt sea here. Remember I told you the salt sea, you guys call it the Dead Sea, 1,270 feet below sea level. Here's the Jordan River Sea of Galilee. This is the country of Jordan. This is you guys. This is you guys here in the Mediterranean Sea. Okay, so Jacob, Esau is down here in Edom. He comes up here on the King's Highway. There's a King's Highway here. They meet here. This is where Jacob wrestles with the angel, Peniel. And Jacob says, I'm going to follow you back down, Esau. And the next thing we hear, Jacob is over here at Shechem. His daughter gets raped there. Now, there's a couple other things that I skipped earlier. Do you know who Moab is? Moab, Moab, you guys would say? Moab is a story I skipped. Uh, this story happens back with Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah, possibly down in here. Lot, Lot was spared Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened to Lot's wife? Lot's wife, she turns around, she looks, she turns into a pillar of salt, right? So now Lot doesn't have a wife. He's got two daughters. Do they have any children? No. So what happens is they, in the cave, they get their father drunk, and they have sex with their father, and they produce then. Do you know what Abba is? Abba, Abba means father. Moav, that's Abba right there. Moav means from father. 
the Moabites are from father. They're Lot's descendants from the daughter. That's what it means, from father. Okay, are the Moabites, is that a really cool title, from father? Not a cool title at all. Now, by the way, you know somebody who's famous in Moab because there's a book named after her. Ruth, the Moabitess, and is the, are the Moabites going to be in the line of David? Is David's great-grandmother going to come, Ruth, from Moab, and is Jesus Christ, the Moabites, are going to be in that line? Okay, Ammon was the other one. The other daughter had sex with her father after she got him drunk, too. And Ammon, this is, has anybody ever heard of Ammon Jordan? Till this day, the name Ammon, or Ammon, is still there. So one of Lot's descendants was here in Ammon, and the other one was here with Moab. Uh, when I was teaching, I taught for a decade in a maximum security prison in Indiana. There was a guy in that prison named Probo. Uh, Probo was uh, one of the smartest guys I've ever taught in my life. Uh, he was an Indian dude. Uh, big. Nobody messed with Probo in the prison, okay? Probo was in the Vietnam era. He was trained. Basically, there was a DMZ, a demilitarized zone. They dropped Probo on the other side of the demilitarized zone with no guns, only a knife in his hands. And he was trained to kill people. Why didn't they give him a gun? Because if you sounded a gun, they would know you were there. And so everything had to be secret. He had a knife in his hands, and he basically killed people on the other side of the DMZ. When he got back to America, what did they do? They put all sorts of medals on him that he was a great hero. One night, he was in a bar, and two guys jumped him. Is he the wrong guy to jump in a bar? Two guys jumped him, and what did he do just with instinctively? He just did his thing, and guess what? There's two dead guys next to him. And what happened to Probo? He gets put away for 35 years. Okay, now question. When Probo walked through the prison, did anybody mess with this guy? No. Everybody know who he was, they know what he did, and they know what he could do, and it was Mr. Provo, okay? <laughs> All right, so anyways, this guy is a pretty intimidating. I mean, he's an old biker kind of guy, big, you know. Anyways, he was in my Old Testament class. So I'm teaching Old Testament. No, I was teaching Old Testament nights. I'd go, I'd teach during the day in college and go out there at night. And I'm watching Probo. He didn't take a, a stinking note in the class. And I'm thinking, Probo, you, and he, he was an unbeliever, and he'd ask me all these questions trying to destroy the Bible and stuff. We got into it. It was all cool and stuff. So I looked at Probo, didn't take a note in the class. And I said, man, this first exam, I'm going to nail that dude, man. He's going to pay for He didn't take a note. He wasn't even paying attention. He took the test, he got a 90, 98 on the first test, a 98. And so I just came to him, I said, Probo, what's the deal? You didn't take a note and stuff. How did you get a 98 on that test? And it turns out that he was trained, he had like a photographic ear. I mean, no, seriously, the guy could, anything I said, he could quote back, he could quote back what I said. I couldn't even remember what I said. He could quote it back word for word. This is the honest truth. And the guy just was, he was like that. When we came to this passage about Lot getting his daughters drunk, or, yeah, the daughter's getting the father drunk and then having sex with the father. Yeah, okay. Probo raises his hand back there, cocky old Probo, and he says, uh, Professor, um, when you're drunk like that, you can't have sex like that. He said, this is the show's obviously an error in the Bible and stuff. I mean, obviously that can't be right. That doesn't happen like that. And I'm sitting there thinking, I'm sorry, but the honest truth is I've never been drunk. And I was saying. Holy cow, Hellebrand, he's catching this one. I mean, I said, what, do you, what can you do when you're not drunk? I don't know. And he said, how do you argue against this guy's experience? So I'm thinking all these reasons in my head. My head's going back and forth. Usually I got a smart, whippy answer. You know, if you guys do it, I, I got a smart, whippy answer. I'm, I'm like totally stumped. It's like, how do I, this guy's telling me his experience. What, how do I, I can't, what do I do? Luckily for me, providentially for me, old Robert was down front. He was an elderly black man sitting down the front. He turns around, looks Probo straight in the face, and he says, Probo, that ain't right. He says, I done that. <laughs> I said, all right, all right. And the question, anyway, you say, that's the honest truth. Uh, anyway, sometime before the course, before the course ends, if I, if I forget, and I probably will, Make me come back to Provo. There's a good end to that story and stuff. But anyway, so you get stumped on some of this stuff. So Moab and Ammon, two important things we'll get later on. Now, Jacob returns to Bethel. What happens here? In chapter 35, when he gets to Bethel, he comes back. This is 20 years later. He comes back to Bethel. And when he gets back there, first of all, he gets rid of all his foreign gods. What does that tell you about Jacob? He gets rid of his foreign gods. Was Jacob an idolater? Did he worship other gods? And so my guess is that Jacob does it like this. 
well, Jehovah's kind of my God, you know, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you know, Jehovah's my God, but I like Jehovah, but do I like these other gods too? Because you can never have too many gods, you know? And you know, you might need some protection, these other stuff. So I think what you've got is Jehovah plus these other gods that Jacob's saying. He uses them for protection, you know, it's like the added benefit. Jacob gets rid of his foreign gods. He's now back at Bethel. He's got to face the real God. And so in chapter 35, he rids himself of his, of his pagan gods. God then comes and reiterates that his name will be changed from Jacob to Israel. And so there is a reiteration of this name change to he who struggles with God. This name Israel is reiterated there. And then what would you expect to be reiterated once again? As he comes back to God at Bethel, God reiterates the covenant to him. What is the covenant? The covenant is the promise. The promise of the what? The land, the seed would be multiplied and they'd be a blessing to all nations. And so the covenant is reiterated to Jacob now as Jacob comes back to Bethel. Bethel later on in Israel's history will be a place of idolatry. It'll be a place where Israel leaves God off. And it's interesting how the name Bethel gets taken and, and uh, taken and, and, and goes after idolatry and stuff later on. We'll see that and Jerusalem takes center stage. Rachel dies, we talked about that, that Rachel dies after he go, leaves Bethel. Rachel dies at Bethlehem on his way down to see his father Isaac. Rachel dies having Benjamin. And uh, we said that that was echoed in Jesus' birth, in the time of the slaying of the infants, and also in Jeremiah in the exile. So this Rachel's death gets exiled or echoed in Jeremiah in the exile, and then down to Jesus in the slaying of the infants. And so Bethel is going to be a significant place. Bethel is going to be a religious place for Israel. This is a place where they meet God at Bethel, okay, the house of God. Now, Jacob and the 12 tribes. Now, first of all, don't, before you copy this down, I do not want you to learn all 12 tribes of Israel. I want you to know four of them. You'll see right off which ones I want you to know. They'll be in yellow. First of all, you've got, let me just put them all up here. Leah has the bulk of the children. Reuben is the firstborn given. Reuben's the firstborn. But the two I want you to know is Levi. Why is Levi important? Levi becomes the, uh, the priests, okay? The Levites and priests, Moses and Aaron, come out of the tribe of Levi. So the priests and Levites will be out of the tribe of Levi. They will be the kind of holy tribe given to carry the tabernacle to minister before the Lord. There will also be Levitical cities later on. So Levi, very important tribe. The other tribe that's important is Judah. Now why is Judah important? Because who will be from Judah? Jesus will be from there, but before Jesus, who? David. The kings of Israel, the kings of Israel, David, Solomon, Rehoboam, Hezekiah, Josiah, all the kings of the southern kingdom will come from Judah. So Judah will provide the kings as Levi will provide the priests, okay, out of that. Now, with Rachel, you need to know both of Rachel's kids. Her firstborn was Joseph. Is Joseph going to be a really important character in Genesis? Yes. And her other son is Benjamin. Now, by the way, why is Benjamin important? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. The first king of Israel will be from the tribe of Benjamin. His name will be Saul. But when I say Saul, who do you know in the New Testament that was named Saul? Paul. And guess what tribe Paul is from? He's also from the tribe of Benjamin. Was Paul the apostle named Saul probably after King Saul from the tribe of Benjamin? Yeah. Yeah, Paul was from the tribe of Benjamin, probably named Saul after King Saul. So you get these. So those are the four that I want you to learn. Okay, Levi, Judah, Joseph, and Benjamin. Later on, the tribe of Joseph will split Joseph will be the northern tribes. Joseph will be the northern tribes. And Judah will be the southern tribes. The country's going to split north and south. Joseph will be in the north. Judah will be in the south. Joseph will actually split into Ephraim and Manasseh. His two kids will actually get an inheritance, both of his kids, Ephraim and Manasseh. So uh, this is going to be the northern kingdom, and Judah will be the southern kingdom later on. So those are the 12 tribes of Israel, and those are really important. And do you remember, there's one girl up there, her name is Dinah. Why is it that Christians, Hannah, do you have a question, quick one? Okay, in chapters 34 and 38, why is it that Christian people skip chapter 34 and 38? And I just want to kind of go through the stories and see if you've ever heard sermons preached on these and why Christians skip this stuff. Chapter 34, first of all, the raping of Dinah. 
Chapter 34, now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, I call him the donkey man because that's what he means, okay. So donkey man goes out and meets Shechem, the son of donkey man, and the ruler of the area saw her. He took her and violated her. That's another way for saying what? He raped her, okay. So Dinah gets raped. Now why is this guy Shechem, why is he really, really stupid? Do you mess with a girl who's got 12 brothers? Do you mess with a girl who's got 12 brothers? The answer is no, that's really stupid, okay? So he, but he violates her. Now what happens? When Jacob heard that his daughter Dinah had been defiled, his sons were in the fields. So Jacob, in a fury, got his sword and went out there and went after him. Is that what Jacob did? Is Jacob a man's man or is Jacob a what? What should he have done as a father? Should he have been out there first? What's Jacob do? It says Jacob here kept, his, kept quiet about it until they, the brothers, came home. Does that bother me about Jacob? I, 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 this Jacob guy, I have big problems with him. Now, when the brothers get home, question is, is there going to be a problem now? The 12 brothers get home, and it says the brothers were filled with grief for their sister and fury. Is the grief and fury, is that a bad combination? Okay, so the 12 brothers go out. Now what happens? Jacob tries to keep the peace a little bit. And let me just kind of narrate the storyline. So he goes to Shechem and Hamar. He goes, he's, and they come out and say, hey, my son Shechem has fallen in love with Dinah. She want, he wants to marry her. And Jacob says, okay. Uh, but see, we're Jewish. See, we're like Jewish people. And we're like of the circumcision. And you guys are like ain't of the circumcision, the uncircumcised. And so like... You need, to, you're, you need to go back and tell your people that they need to all be circumcised. Now, by the way, does Hamor and Shechem go back and convince the whole town to become circumcised? By the way, is that a big deal? And they said, yeah, we can intermarry with these guys. We can trade with them. They can trade with us. We'll marry their children. They can marry our children and stuff. We'll intermarry with them and stuff. They said, okay, let's be circumcised. So they convinced the whole town to be circumcised. And you remember the rest of the story. By the way, does it take all 12 brothers? No. Two. Two brothers go in, Levi and Simeon. Important, those guys are important too. Levi and Simeon, those two brothers go in and take out the whole town, just two brothers. And it says on the third day when they were still, I think the text here says, in pain. Well, obviously they're helpless and stuff, and so the two, I, I shouldn't laugh. It's, it's, not, it's not good, okay? In other words, this is something that happened that's kind of like defiling the circumcision thing is a bad thing, okay? So anyways, this is what this storyline of Dinah. Now why, you know, the question is, why is that story in the Bible? And then you say, by the way, has anybody ever heard a sermon on that? Is that, okay, we've got one here, okay? That's interesting. All right, now you go over to Tamar, the story of Judah and Tamar, and that's in chapter 38. Let me just kind of narrate this story quickly here. First of all, background of the story, Judah had married a Canaanite woman. Is that good or bad? That's bad, okay? Judah had married a Canaanite woman, not good, okay? His son, Ur, had taken this woman, Tamar, and she was also a Canaanite and married her. What happened to Ur? His son, Judah's son, Ur, marries Tamar, and his son, Ur, dies. Now, what's the second son required to do? When the older son has died, what's the second son required to do? Marry the wife and rear children to his brother. In other words, they're not his kids. He's to rear children to his brother in honor of his brother. Okay, they call it the lever at marriage. Is that part of the culture back then? Yeah, like it or not, that's the way they did it. What happens to the second son? Onan marries her, but in the process of having sex with her, he spills his seed on the ground. God gets so hacked at Onan, God takes him out. So now, Ur married Tamar, he's dead. The second son married Tamar, and now he's dead. And you got your third son. Question, are you going to give your third son to this woman? Everyone that touches is dead. So what, no, this is serious. So Judah says, uh, you know, my son, he's just not quite ready yet. He's not quite ready yet. Tamar sees what's going on. And so Tamar then puts on the dress of prostitute. Judah, now you got to be aware of the text, Judah's wife has died. Is that significant? Judah's wife is dead. So Judah doesn't have a wife now. He's out on the road traveling. And he comes up, and here's Tamar, decked out like a prostitute, with her covered up, though, so he doesn't know who it is. And, and she says, well, hey, you know, what do you want, big guy and stuff? How much is it and stuff? Well, he says, you know, do you take Visa or MasterCard and stuff? She says, well, <laughs> he says, I got either one, man. He says, he says, 
okay, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what. You haven't got your changes and stuff like that. What I want from you is you got your signet ring. Now, by the way, why is this signet ring important? Is that Judah's signet ring? That's what he sticks in the mud that indicates it's him. Or as my wife would say, it's he. Okay, bam. So that's it. I want your staff and your ring, and then you go get the goat and bring it back to me. Okay, so he goes into her. She conceives, actually, and then, and then he goes to send the goat. No, it disappeared, and he says, oh, well, she's gone and stuff. Now, a little bit later on, Tamar is found to be pregnant. My daughter-in-law, she is pregnant. Bring her out. She should be burned. She should be burned for defiling our family like that. And Tamar comes out, a hey, Judah, you recognize these? And it's like, um, 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 oh well, um, and Judah's caught, okay, and Judah's caught. Now you say, this story's in the Bible. I mean, this is what happened. Okay, it's in the Bible. Now is the Bible approving the story or is it telling us history? It's telling us what happened. By the way, is Judah a big tribe of Israel? Judah is like David, okay? And as a matter of fact, Tamar, oh yeah, in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 1, guess who shows up? Tamar. In the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Can you believe it? Okay, the background of the story. Now you say, okay, Hildebrandt, what's going on? Why did, why did they put these stories in the Bible? <coughs> why are these two stories in the Bible? I've got a suggestion, and what I'm going to suggest to you is that what you have here is the elimination of the older brothers. The elimination of the older brothers are whom? Okay, in the first story here, who gets eliminated? Levi and Simeon. You say, well, Reuben was the oldest. Yeah, Reuben slept with his father's concubine, so Reuben's out of the picture too. Okay, so Reuben's gone, Levi, Simeon's gone, here's Judah gone as well. And I think it's eliminating the older brothers, showing their corruption, showing the corruption of the older brothers, because who is the focus going to move to? Away from the older brothers to whom? In the end of the book of Genesis, the focus moves away from the older brothers to whom? Joseph. Is Joseph going to be a gem? Joseph is going to be a gem. Okay, Joseph and Daniel in the Old Testament, your two major winner guys, okay? And Joseph. And so I think that the text is using this as a literary technique to move you away from the older brothers to focus on Joseph, and I think that's what's going on here. Oh, focus. I shouldn't have pressed the button. Okay, focus on Joseph. Joseph and the contrast there, by contrast of Joseph and the older brothers. Now, we want to hit the Joseph narrative. This is going to be fast. I want to compare Jacob and Joseph. Jacob and Joseph, I think, in the book of Genesis are compared. Jacob and Joseph, two very different characters, but yet similar things. For example, in both the Jacob story and in the Joseph story, you have the supremacy of the younger brother. Jacob is the younger brother, Esau is the older brother. Jacob is supreme. Joseph is the younger brother, the elder brothers are all corrupt, Joseph is the winner. Okay, supremacy of the younger brother. In both the Jacob story and the Joseph story, you get strife and deception in the family. By the way, can you see deception, the name Jacob? Can you see in strife, the name Israel? Do you remember when I started out Jacob, I started out with strife and deception? Those are Jacob's two names, Jacob and Israel. And basically, the parental favoritism leading to a rival. Did Jacob favor Joseph over the other kids? Did Jacob favor Joseph over the other kids? Remember that coat of many colors? Okay, so he favored them. And whenever you have parental favoritism, does it leave to the brothers and sisters duking it out? And so parental favoritism, sibling rivalry, they both strife in their families. And in this case, both the younger, the guy who was the special one, is separated from his family for 20 years. Jacob is separated from his family up in Haran. Joseph is separated from his family down in Egypt. And then both Jacob and Joseph prosper in a foreign land. Joseph is going to come up, so he's right under Pharaoh. Uh, Jacob gets all this wealth from Laban and things like that, so they both prosper in a foreign land. And then finally, lastly here, both of them, at the end of their lives, are reunited with their estranged brothers. Okay, both of them get, Jacob is reunited with Esau. There's some problems with that. Joseph is reunited with his brothers. At the end, do you remember Joseph? And they kind of come together. So do you see that the stories of Jacob and Joseph are similar somewhat in the, in the, the way the story forms, although they're two totally different characters? Now, another major shift. 
I want to compare Joseph. Joseph is so different. The Joseph narrative in Genesis is so different. And I want to show a connection between Joseph and what I want to call wisdom literature. Joseph and wisdom literature, and just make some comparison. In order to do that, let me tell you a story. I'm going to start a story like this. Once upon a time, once upon a time, do you know you're getting a story when you hear that? Once upon a time, there was a person of very high status, and the person of high status had a problem. And he went all through his kingdom, searching through his kingdom. What story am I, you know, I want you to think of a story. The person of high status goes through all his kingdom trying to find somebody to solve his problem. And finally, he tries the, and it fits. And then he takes the person of low status, and what happens to the person of low status? Solves the king's problem, and, they, and she grows and is put over the whole kingdom, and they all live happily ever after. What story am I telling? Is that some of you saying Cinderella? That's the Cinderella story? I think some of you said pretty woman. Is that the... <laughs> okay. No, no. Actually, I'm dead serious. Is a story of pretty woman built on the Cinderella story. Do you understand? There's a form to this story that's very similar. Okay. Now, with the Joseph story, is that what you have with the Joseph story? The king's got a problem. He has his dreams and nobody can solve it. He finally goes down into prison and finds this person in prison who can interpret his dreams. Does he then interpret his dreams correctly? What happens to the person of low status? He's lifted up with the person of high status, and they all live happily ever after. He does the famine thing, and they go seven years without food. He's got food for them and things, and they're good to go. That's the same kind of structure of the Cinderella story as you have in the Joseph story. That's why the Joseph story is so beautiful. It, it follows that same narrative kind of pattern. Now, does Joseph resist the wild woman? Remember Potiphar's wife goes after him and things. By the way, if that happened anywhere else in the Bible, there would have been a very different outcome. But Joseph is a man above reproach, does not take advantage of Potiphar. And by the way, even in his uprightness, does he end up in jail? Yeah, so this guy is good. Now, by the way, in Proverbs, does Proverbs' father warn his son not to mess around with wild women like that? Yeah, Proverbs chapter 5 and 7 is this major wisdom warning about wild women. Stay away. Joseph actually models that. Are wise men good at interpreting dreams? Do you get wise men to interpret dreams? Daniel is a wise man in Mesopotamia. And Daniel interprets the dreams for Nebuchadnezzar. Joseph interprets the dreams for Pharaoh. He's considered a wise man, and a wise man knows how to interpret dreams. So the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine. And so he saves during the years of plenty and then has the seven years of plenty with the cupbearer and the baker and the stuff in prison. Here's another one. You may not catch this. In Egyptian wisdom literature, the wise man is called the silent man. Now, by the way, in America, is the wise man the silent man, or is the wise man the one that's always shooting off his mouth? But in ancient Egyptian literature, and I'm talking for 2,000 years now, the wise man was considered the silent man. Did Joseph hide his emotions from his brother? When he, when he first met his brothers, did Joseph hide and, and was he silent? And he plays this role of the wise sage. And so Joseph plays the role of the silent man here. And when I say wisdom literature, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, okay? And so this fear of God motif actually occurs with Joseph. The fear of God motif, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God motif occurs with Joseph. And then lastly, and this is their favorite We'll end with this. Jacob the father dies, and now Joseph is left with his 11 brothers. His 11 brothers are scared to death. What are they afraid of? Joseph is in a position of power. They're in a position of weakness. And the brothers come to Joseph and say, Joseph, don't kill us. We didn't really mean to hurt you those years. Ago. Joseph says what? You intended to harm me, but God, what? Intended it for good. But God intended it for good. This reversal is God do the reversal thing. Take what's evil and turn it into something that's good. And Joseph says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. And the whole thing has changed. God, this is God's redemptive work. He takes what's, what's bad and he turns it into something that's wonderful. And he does that with Joseph. And he does that with our lives too. We are done. Genesis. All right. Okay. Let's we'll start on Exodus next time. Okay, see you Thursday, and take care.
This is Dr. Ted Hildebrand teaching Old Testament history, literature, and theology, lecture number 10 on the finishing up of the Jacob stories as well as the introduction and conclusion of the Joseph narrative, concluding the book of Genesis.